And at some point, the World Health Organization declared, you know, the coronavirus a pandemic, even though the week beforehand, we we're all like, there's these cases, new cases every day, and it's in new countries. And when is it going to be a pandemic? When it's not going to be a pandemic, the, the conversation around when to declare a pandemic was like, with climate change, when, when's the moment when everything's fucked? Tipping points in climate change have the political utility of if we do X, Y, and Z, we can stop reaching that tipping point and we will be saved. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a heroic narrative. Just, you know, as long as we stop reaching this tipping point, we're good. We're in not fucked. Also, you can sort of say from a, like it's like an eco-fascistic point of view, this has environmental benefits. You know, surely pollution's down, things aren't driving around, there's dolphins in Venice, there's like oh, I don't know, crocodiles on the beaches in Brisbane. Oh, yeah, who knows what other sort of stuff they'll come up with. There's, big, you know, there's monkeys running riot all through the streets somewhere. You know, it's happy environmental days, the clear skies. And there's this wonder, I think, and there's this fascination with these events that do what we can't. Like, it's as though we're incapable of clearing the skies. We're incapable of stopping inner central production. And that plays into some of the worst tendencies of environmental thinking, I think, which it's not just environmentalists who have this sort of thinking, but you can find it elsewhere. It's easy enough to think of people as an intractable problem, that people have, you know, will never want to give up their, their shiny toys or their monster trucks. So people will never take action on big issues like climate change or homelessness or poverty or hunger. And so what's called for is an intervention, like, but an inhuman intervention. We need a virus to take us out. We need a virus to really show us what's important. We need a virus to remind us that we're human. I guess I find that really sad. There's a sadness to me that it takes a tsunami or a volcano or a pandemic or the bushfires in Australia or the fires in Siberia or the locust plague in the Horn of Africa um, or the floods that were down in Mozambique recently this year, or even if you want to go like a bit further back, the cyclones and the hurricanes. Like the last year, there's been every month there's been a, a, a natural disaster. That's not natural at all. But it takes these events to sort of trigger an outpouring of solidarity, of emotion, of a recognizement, like a rec like a recognition of what's important, what's not, what's essential, what's not. And there's things that are happening, but we're not. The danger is that we think that we're not doing them which in the case of a pandemic is it's easy to think that it's a virus, but we transmit it. We generated the incubation phase for it. We organized the conditions under which it spread. We've continued to organize the conditions under which it became a pandemic. And every single moment that this pandemic continues, we are the active agents of the pandemic. In moments of breakdown, you really do find the emergence of networks of mutual aid. This is kind of the, it's like an unheroic hero, heroism. You know, there's, uh, there's three Facebook groups just in my area that have like between them, like four or 5,000 people who take packages to people who can't leave their homes, who share whatever materials they have. Someone says, oh, I haven't got any paracetamol for my kids. And someone else, else says, oh, I've got two bottles. I can give you one of mine. We start to see an, an eruption of mutual aid and mutual aid networks. And I think the internet's only made that easier to organize in lots of ways, you know. Where that as a hopeful matrix then intersects with some of the legacy of the environmental movement is I think one of the, one of the, the more fringe elements, one of the more hippie elements, one of the more disreputable elements of the environmental movement has always been to go off grid. The idea that you could actually start to create another world now from health and care and mutual education and food production and all this sort of stuff, you know, one of, that's that's some of the legacy of the hippies. You know, it was really a push to the commune, wasn't it? The difficulty is then doing that with highly urbanized populations. So I think we do then have to bring in a third element, which is the right to the city, which again, is maybe is no longer fashionable to talk about the right to the city, but possibly the right to the city not focused on political infrastructure, but on critical infrastructure. What would it mean to democratize the energy grid? What would it mean to intervene into water what would it mean you know this the rent is still you know to democratize housing so i suppose if we're talking walter benjamin it's about pulling the emergency brake 
recognizing that actually the, the we don't necessarily need to start from the position of trying to, to fix a system or reform the system. We actually need to talk about how to get out of the system. 